tick-borne diseases. Uh, many in my audience, they're well aware of things like Lyme disease and, say, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and others. But have you heard of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever? Uh, probably not. It's not real common, and, and people in the U.S. just do not hear about this. But uh, what we recently saw is the first locally acquired case in Western Europe in Spain. So what is it, and how concerned should we be? Uh, joining me now is a friend of the show, Dr. Judy Stone. She is an infectious disease physician and a Forbes contributor, and she addresses this core issue in her latest article entitled, Should You Worry About Tick-Borne Crimean Congo Hemorrhagic Fever in Spain? Hi, Dr. Stone, and welcome back to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me back again, Robert. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's go ahead and start with the basics. Um, and remember, this audience has probably never heard of this. So what is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever? Well, it's a viral illness that causes hemorrhage or bleeding as a prominent sy symptom. This one, as you mentioned, is transmitted by ticks, whereas most of the other hemorrhagic fevers uh, are transmitted by mosquitoes or by rodents. The... One of the things that's scary about this bug is that the infectious dose is very little and it can take only a few organisms to cause an infection and that's part of why it's a public health problem. The other, the other problem is that the, the symptoms are very nonspecific early on and so it can easily be missed, especially uh, if you aren't accustomed to having uh, this Crimean uh, Congo hemorrhagic f fever in in that area, and that's what happened in Spain. And the initial patient who got infected from a tick bite subsequently infected one of his at least one of his nurses, and uh, 200 other people are under observation, and two have signs of early illness. Now, it, uh, this of course is as you mentioned in the article. This is the first time it's been found locally transmitted in Spain. But it's been it's been seen in other countries of Europe. Um, but where is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever typically found? Well, the name comes from it having been found both in the Congo and in Crimea, which, uh, as people may be aware, uh, or maybe not, is an area uh, of the Ukraine which is uh, embattled now with with Russia. Uh, fighting in Russia, and this area has often been uh, a conflict zone. Um, but the the there is a swath of infection that goes through the middle of Africa uh, and then up into the Middle East, the Balkans area, and then to the Ukraine, Turkey, southern Russia, and over to um, uh, as far over as uh, Pakistan. This is the first time that the infection has been seen uh, in in Western Europe. Yeah, and you mentioned Pakistan, and I, uh, we've been covering that on on our website. And Pakistan has reported what about two dozen fatalities from this disease. Well, Right. Yeah. Pakistan uh, has been a hot spot, and uh, you mentioned September 11th, and uh, the following day will be the Eid festival, which is a sacrificial uh, um, Muslim holy day, and many animals will be sacrificed then, um, and likely many people will become ill with with uh, the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever from exposure from infected sheep and goat and and uh, cows. Sure. So so that kind of that kind of leads right into my next question. We know we can get it from ticks. We know we can get it from animal exposure. How else do people get infected with this virus? Agricultural workers at ri are at risk, uh, veterinarians, butchers, um, anybody who may have contact with uh, blood or body fluids from infected animals. Um, but as, we, as we've seen now with the Spanish case, healthcare workers are also at risk right. due to blood exposure, especially when uh, the symptoms are initially nonspecific. Right. So there was an individual that was infected, I guess, via a tick or the animal, and a nurse that got infected from treating this patient. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the the, the uh, 
initial patient was hiking and I got a tick bite okay. and didn't know that there were ticks in that area, infected ticks in that area. Okay. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the symptoms. You said early on it's pretty nonspecific, but it is a hemorrhagic fever. It is. The, uh, I, was, I was surprised that there are actually a number of uh, cases that can be asymptomatic, as we're seeing with, with uh, Zika. But um, more, the spectrum ranges from very mild symptoms. More often, uh, there's a sudden onset of fever, headache, muscle acheness, Aching, muscle aching, dizziness, um, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. This fever and headache and really bad aching can be confused uh, with flu. It can be confused with uh, rickettsial illness, such as Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, or typhus. So um, it's going to be easy to miss, especially in these new areas as the, as the range expands. Yeah. And, um, yeah, like we talked about, then, Pat, go ahead, yeah. Dr. Stone, go ahead. Yeah, and, then, and then as it progresses, as you mentioned, it's a hemorrhagic fever, and people will, will develop uh, bleeding as uh, as was seen with, with Ebola. Sure, and that's where I was headed, because in, in we we're seeing all these fatalities in Pakistan, so we got a pretty high, high case fatality rate with uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is about 40, 50 percent. Right. Yeah. Um, it, but, it, it varies with the level, in part with you know how how readily it's detected and how good the support of medical care is. Sure. Uh, where it happens. Okay, and you said it's a hemorrhagic fever. We determined that. Now, how does it compare to say um, Ebola or uh, dengue, for example? Uh, dengue is at the uh, lower end of the spectrum in terms of killing people. Right. It makes you miserable as co- being called breakbone fever. And the first time it tends not to kill you, but uh, with subsequent infections, uh, you, you get more hemorrhage. Uh, the rate with, with dengue is up to t- about 10%. Uh, with Ebola, as we saw, it goes up to 90% or so, and Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is in the mid, mid range uh, of up to 30 to 40% uh, if people don't get good support of medical care. Right. And the, the patient in Spain, do we know if he, he passed away, correct? Yeah. I'm looking at your article right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I covered this a while ago, and I, I'm kind of a little rusty on the story itself. Um, oh, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and by the way, I did, I did find your article this morning and I'm very grateful for you coming on a short, such short notice. I've been wanting to cover this uh, particular disease for, um, a couple of days now, and I'm grateful this came across LinkedIn. <laughs> now I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to help you, Robin. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let now you, now you cover some other topics that are, um, uh, Related to the disease, uh, but not directly, like uh, you know, symptoms and geography and all that. And I'm really interested in what you have to say about this. And you discuss the effects of climate change and environmental destruction. And can you elaborate on this um, for my audience in in the relationship with Crimean Congo hemorrhage? Sure. Well, I, I try to understand myself why things are changing, and also to put things in context and not just uh, re- regurgitate a news blurb that sure. says somebody sure. somebody died. So uh, in terms of trying to understand why uh, why the ticks are moving into Western Europe and Spain specifically now, um, the ticks are increasing there, uh, again, due to w- warmer climates there. And ticks are increasing in numbers and not dying off in the winter and spreading into new you know, new areas. Um, some of the modeling says that Italy's at risk and uh, the Balkans in particular. And we've seen the same thing in the U.S. with the tick range ex- expanding and the mosquito range expanding further north and longer seasons and more uh, Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases uh, spreading, spreading as they go. Um, in terms of the other really interesting thing is it's kind of a, a no-win situation in that uh, just as with Ebola, where uh, disturbing the jungle uh, 
expose people to more contact uh, with, with the fruit bats or similar things happening in South America, deforestation and irrigation puts people at increased contact with, with the ticks and increases uh, their, their risk. And what I found even more interesting is that the opposite is also true, where in some areas, uh, and I saw this in Europe, where there there is reduction in in uh, farming because there isn't the market there used to be because of globalization. Um, and so leaving areas fallow can actually lead to increases in the tick population because it increases wildlife. And then when people start farming the area or going through the area, they get more outbreaks again. Okay. Interesting. Now, Very curious. Yeah. Now l- l- let me touch on one last topic, and you, you talk about it in your article, and it's really something I'm personally interested in, and I, I covered this kind of stuff um, during the Ebola situation. And, uh, uh, and you, 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 t- you discussed the vilification of humanitarian volunteers battling these outbreaks, and you mentioned uh, Governors LePage and Christie, and which I b- wrote about uh, at that time. And, and I like to just mention one other person. Um, um, I wrote about a tweet that um, Donald Trump did in August of 2014. And this was back when we were really firing up the, uh, you know, Ebola and we were sending out. Yeah. And (laughs) for that reminder. Yeah. Yeah. And the, it's, he tweeted, uh, the U S cannot allow Ebola infected people back. People go too far. People that go to faraway places to help out are great, but must suffer the consequences. Okay, I, I couldn't disagree with that more. And he didn't want um, uh, Doctor um, uh, what's his name Brantley, the the first gentleman that came back. Right. Yeah. Right. He didn't. He, he didn't want them to come back. And anyway, I want to give you the floor for a few minutes and go ahead. I want. I want you to tell me your thoughts on this vilification of humanitarian workers because. You do this, who's going to do this work if you do that? That is exactly the point. Yeah. That is exactly it. So uh, you're, you're, you're right. We saw it a lot with initially with uh, Ebola, with Casey Hickox right. being uh, quarantined despite public health um what was rational for public health. Uh, Chris Christie uh, was grandstanding because it was a political year, uh, as, as was uh, Governor LePage, and she didn't, uh, she didn't deserve that abuse. And everybody was concerned, uh, how are you going to get more volunteers? People are risking their lives to go care for Ebola patients in Africa and try to help there and also try to keep it from coming to the U.S. And yet you're, you're, uh, imprisoning them. Um, one of the nurse, there's a Scottish nurse, uh, Pauline Cafferkey, yes. who's been back in the news again. Uh, this poor woman, uh, almost died uh, from Ebola. She subsequently has had a relapse. Uh, She has will always have ongoing health problems for the rest of her life. And for 18 months now, uh, she's been facing misconduct charges that are lingering for allegedly, quote, allowing an incorrect temperature to be recorded, end quote. Yeah, I saw that. That, That's just absurd. And uh, she should be treated with respect uh, and and appreciation. And the the, the uh, third person who I mentioned, that I'm sure you're aware of, is Dr. Craig Sp- uh, Spencer. Yes, in New York City. Uh, right, in New York City. And he got a little bit less harassment, uh, perhaps, than some of the others, although he was quarantined and criticized widely. And he has a New England uh, Journal article, which... I would encourage people to read, but his his final words on that were, quote, instead of being welcomed as respected humanitarians, my U.S. colleagues who have returned home from battling Ebola have been treated as pariahs. We all lose when we allow irrational fear, fueled in part by primetime ratings and political expediency, 
to supersede pragmatic public health preparedness. Yeah, yeah, End that's quote. well said. Yeah, I got a couple minutes left, and I just wanted to point out <laughs> that you know the whole thing with uh, Casey Hickox, if I recall correctly, that uh, she wasn't showing any symptoms. And, Absolutely, yeah, and she didn't have a fever. Right. So you know, and why I, I'm not sure why anybody would want to listen to topics of public health with Chris Christie versus Doctors Without Borders, these people that are absolute experts in this stuff. And, uh, yeah, it just it just blew me away. I was very disturbed over all that. And, again, that, you, you bring up the great point about elections having consequences and uh, Trump being very unscientific and uh, pitting people against each other. And uh, if he if he prevents health care workers from returning to this country saying, tough luck, you went over there, you should stay there and die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's horrible. I mean, and, you know, my, you know, my hat's off to, you know, Emory University and uh, Nebraska and all these other facilities that saved so many, you know, so many lives that of people that went over there. So, all right, well. Absolutely. Uh, Last thing I, sh- I should say. Yes, ma'am. If you're traveling to Europe or you're traveling anywhere, put permethrin on your clothes to prevent tick and mosquito bites and on your shoes and use uh, deed or picaridin or oil of uh, lemon eucalyptus. But you have to ramp up the protective measures now. Yeah, that's a fact. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your expertise, Dr. Judy Stone. And uh, check out her uh, article on Forbes. It's called, Should You Worry About Tick-Borne Crimean Congo Hemorrhagic Fever in Spain? And I will put a link back on the website. And thanks again, Dr. Judy Stone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, ma'am.